title of my paper is The Depoliticization of Urban Development, the Case of Public Real Estate. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here because it was on short notice that I was able to come here. And yeah, Costas gave um, a very interesting talk about land dispossession two days ago. And today I want to talk about a similar topic, real estate, as I name it. Um, based on my case studies, Frankfurt, Am Main and Berlin, both German cities. Um, based on my case study, I today want to talk about the way how urban public authorities are dealing with publicly owned real estate under crisis, crisis and austerity, and in what sense it can be described as a depolitization of urban development. On Thursday, and in the first two-thirds of my talk, the financial aspects of land, properties and real estate are mentioned more than once, but I try to add this, yeah, an additional perspective on this topic and at the last third of my talk. Um, yeah, what I want to talk about is a rough sketch of my PhD thesis I'm currently working on. Um, though especially compared to Costas, I am not an expert about Greece and the crisis and real estate here. I want to start with Greece to show the connection between urban crisis or crisis and real estate. Um, because when I prepared my talk, I browsed through the economic adjustment program of the European Commission and found this passage. I hope you can read this here. <coughs> Given the high share of real estate asset in total, Expected privatization proceeds uh, in total expected privatization proceeds action in this area remains crucial, but legal complexities make proceeds in the short term limited. Efforts need, however, to be stepped up in developing a coherent and comprehensive strategy for privatizing real estate assets. That's about the about Greece, and further. Um, I found, uh, I, I have a, had a look on the website of the Hellenic Republic Asset Development Fund. <coughs> and they, it's another <coughs> institution beside the topic thing, you all, uh, most of you know better than me. Um, but on this website I found a vision, as they call it. And this vision is, the Hellenic Republic's privatization program represents a key initiative in attracting direct investments in infrastructure, energy, real estate, and other fields. Privatization is not seen as a mere sale of assets. Rather, it is a key element of re-establishing credibility itself, the basic prerequisite of Greece's return to uh, global capital markets. So that's enough from me about Greece and real estate. It's well just to emphasize this yeah, importance of real estate and crisis processes. Um, what I now will do is more detailed on my both case studies and I want to try to answer the question what policy strategies can be identified in urban austerity and crisis processes with respect to publicly owned real estate. For that the first step was to connect crisis and real estate on the example of Greece. The next <coughs> thing is to make some conceptual remarks about urban governance as depolitization with just one slide. And afterwards I will give you just a brief overview about two of my two elements of my case studies I want to talk about. And at the end I try to make a summary of all of this. Urban governance. Um, Urban governance, in my point of view, has to be understood as a new political strategy of governing, as Alex Demirovic puts it. And Bob Jessop yeah, has a more specific perspective, and he says, governance or urban governance um, tries to achieve state objectives by mobilizing knowledge and power resources from influential non-governmental partners and stakeholders. <coughs> Um, this means that privatizations, for example, don't have to be understood as a decline of state regulation. Instead, 
for me, I would say it can be seen as an expansion of execu executive authority in this sense. And this whole process, it's, it's a more a thesis, um, such forms of governance or urban governance are resulting in the depoliticization of urban uh, de development. The depoliticization I want to explain as Swingedu had said, erosion of the political sphere, sphere, which should be, actually should be, char characterized by um, dissent, disagreement, and conflict, or as <coughs> another person said, Colin Crouch said, that political decisions are made beyond the existing institutions of represent representative democracy. Now to my first case study, Berlin. I have some numbers, I don't know if you can read it. That's uh, <coughs> the depth of Berlin since 1992 to 2012. This is zero euros and 65 billion euros. And Anna showed you two days ago, I think, this part in another resolution. <laughs> but um, as you can see, um, <coughs> if we stretch the time scale a bit, that there was a massive de debt increase since the early 1990s in Berlin. <coughs> um, there were a lot of modernization processes and reforms to and consolidating measures because of this, the financial situation and austerity measures to consolidate the um, budget of Berlin, but I want to talk only about one of them, which is related to, to real estate. In 2001, the so-called Liegenschaftsfonds Berlin, or in English, Real Estate Fund Berlin, took up business activities and its foundation was completely legitimated as an austerity measure or as a crisis measure, consolidating measures. So, what is this Liegenschaftsfonds Berlin, this real estate fund? The real estate fund is in its legal form an unlimited company and it's full, fully owned, a fully owned subsidiary of the Federal State Berlin, of Berlin. Um, its purpose is to sell publicly owned real estate and to make a distribution to the budget consolidation of, the, of Berlin. And its measure is a market oriented, oriented registration of real estate and a ceiling price orientation, the highest price a person is willing to pay for a certain real estate. In summary, the LFB or the real estate fund uh, real, estate, uh, real estate fund's task is to sell as much publicly owned real estate as possible for the highest price as possible, which is legitimated with the necessity of budget consolidation. The legal form of the Liegenschaftsform made it possible to hire real estate professionals for higher wages than the employees in the public sector in Berlin get. So this, with this um, professional knowledge about real estate economy and real estate market markets was acquired in the public in the yeah <coughs> extended arm of the public administration in Berlin. Um, the political order was to um, yeah sell real estate uh, real estates with a maximum profit, and they said that. Because this, this economic rationality makes this whole process transparent and free of ideology. <coughs> uh, ide ideology. So, nothing was to debate about. Um, with this orientation, um, the fund is the tool, as I said, and the extended arm of the financial department of Berlin's government, which is under minimal control of the parliament. If necessary, I can explain this later, but it's a bit complicated to put it in short words. Um, but the question is what happened in the years after 2001 till today? Surprise, surprise. 
they sold public property. <laughs> <laughs> so this, these are here the, the figures from 2004 to 2012. Um, earlier, yeah, amount I was not able to find them in a. I had them only in an aggregated form, but um, the blue columns here shows the volume of sale, the <coughs> return of the uh, uh, fund, and that's here 150 million in the middle, and so the highest one is around 280 million of profits from selling real estate in Berlin. And the orange line here are the, the area in hectare they sold in this time. Um, so now I make um, some different thing on this side because now it's a small discourse, uh, excourse about crisis in Germany. When I switch back to this side, it's about real estate. Um, <laughs> as you can say, see here, 2008 or 2007 and 8, the amount of profit was very high. It's in, in relation to the sold um, hectare, the, the area. In two, 2010, it's, it's the same relationality. They had a high profit and they sold the second lowest amount of hectare in this year. If you see the year 2009, the, the um, <coughs> amount of hectare they sold was the second most in the time between 2004 and 2012, but the um, profit they made with it is the second lowest in this time. So it's not, I will not say that this is crisis, but I think it can be an indicator that this is crisis related, that the profit of um, selling real estate went down in this year and after that it went up. So. <laughs> I went back to this, to this, to this side. Um, that's just a brief overview, as I said. And um, I want to show you two other things about this development. Um, as you re remember, the um, <coughs> vision of the HRADF with the direct investments and stuff, it's the same thing. Uh, Berlin is legitimating the sell-off of real estate. They said we get a huge amount of investments in Berlin. The um, dark blue one is um, from new development. Oh, sorry. Yeah. New <laughs> development. <laughs> and um, the light blue one is um, redevelopment. And that's in, in this time from 2001 to 2011, it's about um, 7.7 .7 billion euros um, private investors invested in Berlin um, in following the sale of real estate, public own, publicly owned real estate. The other point I want to talk about is that um, the, with this policy, the local government of Berlin is profiting actively from an overall trend in, Ber in the Berlin real estate market, especially mm. after the crisis. I have some newspaper headlines for you. It's the translation. The first is the new real estate capital in Portray. The new capital is Berlin. Or the second one, in Berlin the real estate prices rise the most. And the subtitle said, thanks to the crisis more investors are investing in Berlin. And the last one, the whole world buys Berlin real estate. So the Liegenschaftsfonds it's just a small or a small actor in this whole process. But the crucial point is that the public government or the local government in Berlin yeah, provides a policy which is actively based on rising real estate prices. Um, this whole um, strategy or this policy was about yeah, nearly 10 years um, hegemonic in Berlin <coughs> because of this high <coughs> debt level I showed you before. Mm. But in 2009, the debt level <coughs> stabilized and this whole policy became contestable. And now there is a 
since then there is a <coughs> citizens initiative who try to establish a more sustainable and qualitative oriented real estate policy in Berlin. But most of them are creative professionals, so there are some problems which I could explain if you want me to later. <laughs> now to my second um, case study. Same time range, completely different line, debt level of Frankfurt since 2000, uh, 1991 to 2012. Um, I keep this short. Um, I just changed the side to this one. Another excourse about Germany and the crisis, or German cities and the crisis. From my perspective, a few I can show you. This little rise here at the end. You see a great development of the debt level. And then, oh no, 2011 goes up about 300 million in one year. <coughs> the city of Frankfurt had huge amount of um, cash assets uh, till 2011. They had 400 million in cash on bank accounts and stuff like that. And they spent all the money they had and had to raise their credit level, their debt level. So that's a small indicator to the 2008 crisis. I just mentioned that because uh, the whole other process we discussed this two days ago is a more uneven development in German cities about debt and crisis and stuff like that. <coughs> so that's German cities and 2008 crisis. I come back to my original topic. <coughs> so high debts in the 1990s. Again, surprise, surprise what happened. Without a special company they founded, they sold real estate. As you can see here, it's all a bit lower amounts of money in Frankfurt. That's because of this difference in debt between city-states and other municipalities in Germany. But the, it's the same, um, same principle. The debt level was the highest in 1995. In 1996, they sold real estate for over 300 million euros in Frankfurt. And then it declines. Um, and in my interviews, um, the interview my interview partner said, OK, they sold their the most valuable stuff in the 90s. And after that, nothing more was left, which was valuable enough to put on the market. <coughs> but. I don't want to bore you with all these graphs and numbers and stuff. I want to add this, I uh, said, additional perspective on real estate, crisis, and um, local um, government. For that, I want to show you another quote of um, uh, Josef Esser and Joachim Hirsch. And they said that strategies introduced from the restructuring of capital are particularly targeted at urban development. And further, the red line over here, strategies of local government policies under the recurrent formula of urbanity stand beside urban econo uh, econo econo uh, economizing processes which are aimed at developing new forms of labor, social classes, and consumer models. What I now want you to show is the last graph uh, from me today. This is the population development in Frankfurt. So here, here is 630,000. So I cut it off to make a more dramatic <laughs> um, development. But you can see here <laughs> that, that um, the population falls from, in 1992, from more than 660,000 to 1997 around 640,000, no, yeah, 45,000. So this mm. declining trend was problematized in um, local policy, in local politics in, 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 in Frankfurt. And the former, <coughs> the former head of the um, planning department um, 
problematize that there was a decline, especially of the tax paying pop, uh, of the tax paying population in Frankfurt, and a corresponding relative de increase of poorer <coughs> social classes in Frankfurt. In the 1990s, more and more people with middle and high income moved to the commuter belt of Frankfurt in the surrounding Rhein-Main area. Um, and based on this problematization, the city of Frankfurt started several projects to create attractive residential and living areas, for example, at the River Main, um, for people with middle and high income. Besides development companies and other public-private partnerships, the city of Frankfurt in 1994 um, founded the so-called uh, the, the public-private partnership KEG. It's roughly translated as conversion conversion estate development company, um, with a private planning and engineering office. Um, and this, I, I ask you to remember, in the time where Frankfurt has the highest debt in 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 this period of time. So they had no money, actually, but they want to do some urban development. So what's the <coughs> KEG? It's the similar sheet to the Liegenschaftsfonds. The KEG is an unlimited company, but a public-private partnership. Its purpose is to buy and valorize, in the beginning, just military, but at the end, other brownfields in Frankfurt. And the purpose is not financial profit as the Liegenschaftsfonds. It's more the social return and the possibility for urban de development. <coughs> for that, the central measure is attracting private investors. So, to summarize this, oh, I just want to tell you what the, what they are doing actually. They um, they attracting investors, as I said. They um, it's a construction and diverse mixed residential of uh, diverse mixed resi residential areas, production of supplementary so social infrastructure, fast handling of preparatory measures such as demolition, demolition, unsealing, un uh, con uh, unsealing contaminated land disposal, rapid construction of utilities and transportation infrastructure, worth uh, keeping and conversion of listed buildings for after use and creation of public green spaces and leisure facilities. Um, so it's a private company, uh, the legal form is a private company, but they are doing stuff like social infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, um, yeah, listed buildings, and keep old buildings in, in, in function or the creation of public green spaces. Um, for the population in Frankfurt. But in this form, <coughs> to s put it in, in one term, it's just a letterbox company. The, the KIG has no own office spaces, the KIG has no own personnel, they're just doing stuff in contract by the private partner. And uh, um, <coughs> the chairman of the company is the Council of Urban Planning of the city of Frankfurt. So there's a close linkage between the local administration or the local government and this legal form, this letterbox company, KIG. And they <coughs> used it to develop brownfield areas in Frankfurt, and I want to show you three examples of that. I don't know if you can see them. It's all military areas of the US Army in Frankfurt. Um, that's the Michael and McNair barracks motor pool of the US Army and the Edwards barracks and that's uh, pictures from the time while the US Army were using it and um, the motor pool is just the abandoned area and after the KIG yeah, took over these projects they looked like this so attractive living space, green areas and you know, so like that for um, yeah for the for yeah more middle class or in some time some parts for high income population. So as I said, this all is just a it's on the surface of this whole.
process and I hope you get an impression what I'm talking about and for me these processes, these strategies can be lived up to a more abstract um, scale and I want to try to do this at the end. So the question was what policy strategies can be identified in urban austerity and crisis processes with respect to public real estate? I have to extend this in German cities in this talk. And I think you can see the following. You can see that in both cities, the local government undertakes an active restructuring of fields of action. They try to get new ways or to, to invent new ways to um, do public service tasks or part of them. They use new knowledge and they opening up action resources for doing this. New personnel which they could not employ it under the restrictions of public service in Germany. Or um, with the yeah, letterbox company in Frankfurt that is uh, specialized in urban planning and project management. And in both cases you can see that there's a massive orientation to the, towards private money, private investors to realize the go different goals both um, um, institutions have. And with that, I would say the, there are changes of the strategic select selectivity of the local state. So it's different if you have to um, talk to a yeah, part of the local administration, uh, to the local administration in an office or some department, um, as if you talk to a private company which is acting on the market and have um, mainly um, economical interests. And that's another point. In both cases, I think you can see strat the strategy of depolitization the, in dealing with public real estate. Because on the one hand, the main rationality or the dominant rationality in dealing with public real estate becomes an economic one. So the companies have to function as a company, and that's the basic principle for the whole process. That's the first. You cannot question that. That's set. And the other thing is that in both cases, the legal form is used to, yeah, to, how can I say that, to put the decisions away from the parliaments, to have a greater distance between the parliaments, the voted um, representatives of the population in the city, and the decision making in these um, institutions. And that's <coughs> the last point and the thing I want to add to this discussion in, about real estate and austerity and crisis, there's also a socio-political dimension of that, that it, this, it has a quality what people live in a, c a city and who don't have a, and who don't have to live in a city in this way. So if you want to, you can say perhaps it's even a biopolitical dimension of this whole process because it aims at the population of a city in the case of Frankfurt. And um, let's, you see the circle, circle is closed. So this means I'm at the end of my summary. And I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to discuss <laughs>